week's storm of everything brass i have on the line simon austin who's a musician composer and an enthusiastic supporter of the spalding flower parade which is held in lincolnshire here in the united kingdom every year now the spalding flower parade is one of the most important events in spalding's history with the attendees actually traveling from every corner of the united kingdom and in fact worldwide as well simon great to have you on my show now you grew up in newbury berkshire you attended the bartholomew's grammar school where you studied violin for 10 years under the distinguished violin teacher uh, gene hodkiss yeah hello peter really lovely to be on show, Jean Hodgkitt was a remarkable woman. Um, she taught me violin for 10 years and she taught me so much more. She taught me music theory and you know when you have a great teacher you learn about life. Uh, I can't speak too highly about Jean Hodgkitt. Yeah, I understand what you're saying there. Uh, when I became a musician myself and I started at such a uh, that I actually started at the age of five uh, so it's been a big part of my life. But when I went into the military and became a French horn player, uh, having that communication and that kind of a musical bonding with a professor or even a teacher, I think that is it's the first step uh, on the I, which I look at as like the, the correct road to success, basically. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and the opportunities that she gave me, I. I got to play violin concertos with orchestras all through the fact that she arranged it. And um, it, it kind of saved my teenage years. During this period, you regularly performed a violin concerto, obviously accompanied uh, by orchestral for the... Uh, and you was the principal violinist uh, for a performance of a West Side Story. Yes, my school decided to put on a performance of West Side Story. At the time, I was leader of the school orchestra, and I must say it was a tremendous experience. Um, I could play really well at that age, and I got that first violin part pretty much note perfect. And in fact, the whole school orchestra at the time was stuffed full of really talented musicians. And one of those was uh, Paul Sanders, who may be known to some of your listeners. He's uh, run Cold Ash Brass for many years uh, in the interim and uh, taken part in many uh, competitions um, over, over the year. Um, well, obviously, a lot of my listeners will know the composer. Obviously, West Side Story is, a, is a, quite a famous film and musical on the West Side and obviously on Broadway as, uh, as well. And I must admit, I've got, I've got to uh, say that uh, I love one of your philosophies and you, your, comp your composing philosophy is to write music which is great to play and also is great to listen to. It's an absolutely fantastic philosophy that I'm going to be taking away and using definitely because I couldn't agree with that saying uh, 100%. Uh, what made you come up with that saying? Well, I started composing in earnest in 2016. And it has been a desire that has been growing in me for a year or more. And I was thinking about it for quite a while. And I thought, look, the, the world is full of absolutely fantastic music. And if I am going to compose, then I, I really don't want it to be a situation where it's not bad for an amateur or it's just somebody having a go but everybody who hears it has to be polite because that's what we're all like i thought i really need to be doing something that, that contributes and that i really want my pieces to stand up and the two ingredients that came to mind were great to play and great to listen to now one of the things that really sparked that into life was thinking about my dad when I was in my youth and learning and performing a lot he sat through many of my performances and I think there were quite a lot of pieces in that era where I enjoyed playing them when I honestly asked myself did my dad enjoy listening to that 
I think there were quite a few pieces I played in that era where the answer to that was not necessarily uh, yes. So I thought, what am I going to try and achieve? Well, first of all, I want to write something that's actually intrinsically good, just not bad for an amateur. It wasn't going to be uh, cutting it. And these were the two things that needed to run through the spine of the music to actually make all the effort required to compose music worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you there. Uh, and going back to, obviously, you played the violin and you started playing the uh, violin or a stringed instrument from such a young age and I don't mis I don't I don't mean to be uh, one of these uh, stereophonic people that repeat stuff and that uh, but I remember actually that it, it something just come to my mind that I, I didn't mention before was one of my nieces actually wanted to play a violin and my sister her mum had turned around to her and said no I'm not going to have something that sounds like someone strangling a cat. And I thought that was a bit mean, really, but I can understand when you're playing it and you're trying to learn notes and it, it does sound until you've got the the use of the bore correctly on the strings and how to press until the, the ends of your fingers get hard and, you know, they, they um, strengthen up so you can press down properly. I can imagine what your dad was probably thinking or your parents were thinking at the time as well. But I think deep down, I think now, if he had to hear you now, I think he'd be really, really proud, actually. I really do. Yeah, there's a, there's a fundamental uh, fact about learning to play a stringed instrument, particularly a violin, that really, for the first two years, you don't make a very pretty sound. It's just a fact of life. Yeah. And it takes quite a bit of determination to get through that so that you can then actually make music that has a, 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 a value uh, in itself rather than it being, business me, do I really have to put up with this noise? Well, I think that takes, that doesn't just go for um, a stringed person, person who plays strings instruments. I think that goes for any instrument that you learn to play. Maybe not a piano, even though, you, you know, the notes are pretty solid when you hit them, but playing even black playing in the brass band playing brass and learning to blow at first time and and you're getting some weird noises coming out until you get used to it and i think a lot of these misconcept with a lot of people is you know a lot of these players that have been playing for 30 40 you know plus years it's taken probably the first 10 years to get to a percentage and to get to a standard where it is quite pleasant to listen to. Uh, myself being ex-military, uh, my the military band that I was with was, was an Irish regiment. So we had bagpipes also in our band. And when I first heard bagpipes, I thought, oh, what a drone of a sound, even though he's called a drone. Uh, but once you got to hear it more and more and more, you started to appreciate it. And I think that's personally what it's like for any musician and any kind of music out there. Yeah, um, there's no question that you, you take a lot of time to, to, to learn an instrument. And I'm, I'm coaching the Scalding Youth Orchestra. And, uh, yeah, I see that the, the kids who make progress are the ones with the character to, and, and determination to, to keep going because it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, I wonder how many of these children out there these days that are learning a string instrument actually enjoy it more because they know that they can annoy the parents more with it until they get better. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, I think it, I, I think it's a test of character as much as skill. On both, on, yeah, on both sides, both on the child and on the parent side as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. You, now, you compose 10 short sonatas for the violin and piano uh, called the Spalding Sonatas, uh, which is a, well, it's a fiendishly difficult uh, duet suitable, which you say, for performances as an encore as well. Was the Spalding Sonata what got you inspired into doing the Spalding uh, Flower Parade? Yes, and in fact, I didn't know it at the time. Now, I wrote the Spalding Sonatas in 2020. Um, they're 10 uh, short performance pieces for violin and piano. 
And at the time, the flower parade had been lost to the town of Spalding. So the last flower parade was in 2013. And the thinking uh, seven years on was that the flower parade was lost to the town forever. Now, we know that not to be true, uh, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that. Amongst those 10 pieces uh, was a piece called Flower Parade. Now, the others are about, for example, the river running through the town, the River Welland. Um, There's one about the park and museum that's in the town. So there are different pieces about different parts and aspects of the town. At the time, you could have rightfully said, well, what is this piece called Flower Parade in in amongst these uh, pieces? Because what is it? It's and well, it had to be explained, it, it was a major, major thing with huge crowds that uh, came every year to, to the town of Spalding. So the violin and piano version has a certain pathos that reflected that apparent loss. Uh, I would say uh, akin to the sadness behind the face of a clown. And uh, the piano and violin lends that to the piece. So um, I, I was very pleased with it as a, as a, as a piece of art, but uh, obviously um, it was a shame that it was reflecting a lot of pride in the town, uh, the fact that the town was no longer celebrating this annual event. That all changed, of course, uh, in 2023, when a team in Spalding led by Stephen Timewell uh, revived the Flower Parade to the great benefit of the town. Yeah, I was uh, reading online about the Flower Parade just to get a little bit inside a side of it because I must admit that probably one of many people has never heard of it um, and now it's attended by literally well over thousands of people that come from literally all around the world to come and watch these floats that go down the street or dressed up with flowers. And for any of my American or listeners from abroad, uh, when you hear the word float, it's not something like flotation device. That's what the British call a a basically a lorry, a wagon with a trailer on the back, a flat trailer which is decorated with flowers um, and things like that. Up and down our country, different parts of the UK call it different things. We we have carnivals, which is a lot like the same thing. They decorate floats. And that's what the Spalding Flower Show is as well. It's like a big carnival, isn't it? That's absolutely right. And it reflects the tradition of tulip growing that Spalding and the surrounding area had. And at its peak, it was achieving crowds of 200,000 from all over the country. Uh, The royal family got involved with their jubilee in 1935. Mm. So uh, all in all, it was uh, an event that uh, had national reach and national notoriety. Um, I think it was in 1959. It was featured on the front page of national newspapers. So i um, happy to say that Stephen Timewell and his team are really uh, getting those glory uh, years back. Um, we had the first revival in May last year, and the second parade uh, since the revival is planned for the 11th of May in Spalding in Lincolnshire. Yeah, uh, as I was saying, obviously looking looking up and looking at it myself, I'd never heard of it, and it had been announced that early this year that the 2024 uh, Flower Parade was to go ahead again, which is brilliant. In, and like you said, in fact, it, the last last year's parade was the first time the parade had been held since, unfortunately, it stopped back in 2013. I think it was due to lack of people getting involved. Yes, there are a number of reasons why it stopped. So, um, but all in all, it reflected a, a kind of negativity in the town that was a shame. And the revival has brought back a pride, an energy, a buzz. Um, it's been fantastic for the town. The community spirit has been lifted. So, uh, all in all, very happy that it's back. And what got you into uh, coming up with the idea to write uh, your album, which you've uh, started doing, called the Spalding Flower Parade? So that evolved over time. Um, So for the first uh, revival parade, so that's May last year, um, I wanted to get involved immediately 
And so I approached the Flower Parade Committee and I said, look, I happen to have written a piece of music called Flower Parade. If I arrange it for brass bands, would you endorse it as the official theme tune for the Spalding Flower Parade? Now, this was all agreed uh, very quickly with a lot of enthusiasm. So I took my piece for piano and violin and arranged it for brass band. I then took it to the nearest uh, local band, the Hall Beach Town Band, and the musical director there, Mel Hopkins, he was very enthusiastic and the band uh, played it. They actually were in the parade playing it. And the whole thing was a very positive experience and a very positive part of the Spalding Flower Parade. Now, we then moved on from there. I thought to myself, well, maybe I can get away with just repeating what we did in 2023 and 2024. But, you know, I thought, that's, that's a bit weak. So I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to complete the whole set so I wrote nine further pieces, and so together with the original piece, I've now got uh, a CD uh, with 10 brass band pieces, and they are known as music or the famous Spalding Flower Parade. And the sheet music is available through a link on the Sounds of Brass website by I believe there's a photograph of me. You can click on it, and that will take you straight through to the ability to uh, purchase the sheet music for your brass band. Just going slightly back a little bit, uh, a little story that you were telling me, a lovely story right, you were telling me uh, before we came on air, was uh, about an 18th birthday present uh, that you did. Was it for your goddaughter? Yes. So the... Um, the Going back to 2016, and I wanted to start composing, one of the things I decided to do was I would write 10 piano pieces for my goddaughter. Her 18th birthday was coming up, and I thought this would make a nice present. Um, I have to say, that's quite a difficult decision to come to, because when you actually... Um, write music, you're revealing a part of yourself. It can make you very vulnerable. It's, it's like, um, you know, um, showing your vulnerabilities and the inside of your character to those listening. But I went ahead with it nonetheless, and um, I gave it to her for her 18th birthday. I managed to get all the pieces uh, completed on time. I'm very gratified by the fact that she has since told me that it was the best present she'd ever received. And there's a lot of interesting uh, thinking to, uh, that, that, that arises from that. I think that is the only 18th birthday present that I've ever given to anybody that actually didn't cost me any money. And that, too, was a, a source of difficulty in the run-up to it. I, think, I was thinking to myself, you know, there's people who may be going to be turning up with some quite nice jewellery or expensive presents, and there's going to be Simon Paul Austin turning up with some sheet music that he didn't actually pay a single cent or a single penny for. But, um, as I say, happily it worked out and it was uh, appreciated a great deal in the way that I had hoped. Yeah, the, the thing, though, the, I, I, I think, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of your goddaughter, it's not always spending the money that, you know, the, the people enjoy. What you've done, you did it from your heart, and then that'll mean more to somebody than a diamond ring. Well, probably not a diamond ring, but you, you know what I mean? Something, you know, something <laughs> expensive <laughs> um, and that. But you, you, obviously, you grew up in Berkshire, so what is your actual association with the Spalding and Flower Parade? I first started going to Spalding around about 2003, I think it was. I was actually visiting uh, an old school friend, um, a lady friend, who has since become my wife. Um, we'd known each other at school a little bit, um, and purely platonically, but uh, we got back in touch um, and we were both on
on our own at the time. Um, so I thought, well, it'd be interesting to go and visit. Um, but things progressed happily, and uh, so we're now since uh, married, and uh, I've moved to Spalding. But around about that time, 2003, the Spalding flower parade was still going strong. So I had 10 years of when I was uh, making sure that I was visiting Spalding at the time of the flower parade. And they were very happy. There was a community spirit. There was an excitement. Um, the house where I was staying is on the parade, and I, I now live in that house. So uh, the parade comes right past where we live. And um, so the revival has been a very happy thing uh, for all of us. That's absolutely brilliant, that is. Now, uh, the, obviously, the string and the piano piece, the Spalding Sonatas, how did you manage to, you know, to, tran to get it to transcend from being an art to being a, a string and piano piece to actually writing it down to becoming a, a brass band piece of music? Because that can't have been easy, especially in, in somebody in your uh, expertise where you're writing for string and piano and then you'll all of a sudden you're writing for different brass instruments, 20, 27 brass instruments. Yes, musically, that was quite a challenge because my knowledge of brass band uh, instruments was poor. So I, I went on something of a crash course on, on how to uh, write for brass band, uh, the capabilities of the instruments, the ranges of the instruments, um, the, the um, musical nuances that the, all the different instruments have. Um, but actually, a very interesting uh, thing came out of it. I, I mentioned that the Flower Parade piece, um, I mean, I've written it, it is a march, and I've written it uh, with a certain amount of pathos that a piano and, and violin could bring out. As I was transferring it to brass band, with the knowledge that the Flower Parade was being revived, I was able to kind of remove the pathos, strip away any sadness, and that piece has an exuberance and uh, a sense of fun that I think is just perfect for the parade, and certainly the whole Beach Town band uh, really enjoyed playing it. Yeah, absolutely brilliant, because I was reading the, the obviously the write-up, the biography bit, like the write-up about the Spalding Flower Parade that you sent me, um, one thing that caught my eye was uh, BBC Radio uh, Lincolnshire, I think it is, was, uh, and you ended because you don't play a brass instrument, or you never played a brass instrument, did you? No, and this came out in the BBC interview, um, and as a result of that, the interviewer challenged me to be playing with the whole Beach Town Band in the, in the Spalding Flower Parade uh, within a year. And at the end of the interview, I was mulling that over and thinking, that, that's not very practical, that's not realistic. But I asked around and discussed it with a few people, and, um, yeah, the consensus was that someone with a musical ability ought to be able to pick up a brass instrument and be proficient enough to join in within about six to nine months. So I took up the challenge... I went on the instrument learning scheme that the whole Beach Town Band runs. Uh, it's actually run by the musical director, Mel Hopkin. And um, I've learned really from... And I can confirm that I will be playing with the whole Beach Town Band in the Spalding Flower Parade on the 11th of May, 2024. Well, on that note, I'll tell you what, I, if that was me put in that position, I would be turning around to the interviewer and going, can you play a stringed instrument? And if they said no, I'd say, I'd like you to go away and play the violin in nine months. I bet this soon changed the tune, but well done for you actually taking on that challenge and, and succeeding. And I'm, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'm hoping to uh, try and get down there for me and go down to this uh, power, power, this flower parade uh, myself, because like I said, I, I'd never been to one. Oh, no, actually, I have. Oh. I've seen them, but I saw them in Amsterdam, because they do things like that in Amsterdam, uh, with yes. flowers and that. Yes. Of course, the other thing that happened in the interim between uh, May 2023, the first revival, and, and now, 
is adding the nine pieces to, to, to the original piece and creating the CD uh, music for the famous Folding Flower Parade. Yeah, I, I was just about to come to come uh, actually come up to that one now uh, about the album, uh, the Spalding Flower Parade. I think it's Reborn, it's called, which started off as a, a single piece of music and now is the name of the album dedicated uh, solely to the Flower uh, Parade. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so um, the CD is made and um, it's available for purchase in uh, the local bookshop. So that's uh, called Bookmark of Spalding. For anyone who wants to buy it there. Um, the sheet music is available online uh, via the Sounds of Brass website. So it's all just gathered pace in, in a tremendously positive way. Uh, I should mention that all proceeds are going to the Spalding Flower Parade Fund. So uh, any streaming revenues, uh, any sheet music sales, any CD sales, all the proceeds are going to the Spalding Flower Parade Fund. So I think it's very important that this becomes a force for the good of the town. Right, oh, that's absolutely brilliant, brilliant news. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, get down there uh, this year to uh, see it myself and obviously catch up with you uh, if I'm, when I'm down there. Uh, on that note, I'd like to say a big, big thank you for taking your time out uh, to be here on Everything Brass and the Sounds of Brass Radio. Uh, and to all my listeners out there, you can go onto the Sounds of Brass uh, website and go down to the bottom and look up Simon's picture there where you can find all the information and place where you can purchase the brass band pieces of uh, music. Uh, the music for the famous Spalding Flower Parade is available also on all the streaming platforms uh, where you can find all the music with videos that contain photographs and some beautiful photographs I must say as well. It makes the town look so picturesque and some short clips from previous parades on YouTube as well. And just a note for all listeners remembering that uh, I'm here every Thursday from 4 to 6 and the show is repeated again. Uh, from 4 to 6 on a Sunday where you can also catch up with this interview and all previous shows by going to YouTube, typing in the search bar Sounds of Brass and looking up all the shows that have already been on and you can listen to them all back at your heart's content. So on that note, I'd like to thank Simon for taking time out today to speak to us here on Sounds of Brass and hopefully... We'll get to speak again uh, in the near future with any other projects or music you've got may have coming up. Yeah, thank you, Peter. It's been my pleasure to uh, chat to you today. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks very much, Simon, for that. And uh, hope very, very soon. <laughs> Hello, my name's Chris Johnson, and I am the producer.